So thanks very much indeed. Um, I, when, when I was asked to talk about this, I first went online to see if I can get a good definition of an autoimmune disease. And the one that came up was a condition arising from an abnormal immune response to a normal body part. And as we go through this, I'd like really to question whether it's not a normal immune response to maybe an abnormal body part rather than what we're used to thinking about. And if you're going to define it, um, you, you've got the criteria which you can see listed there for a, um, to define the characteristics of an autoimmune condition. They are going back 20 odd years, but as I hope I can show you with my own example, age is not necessarily meaning irrelevant. We know with a lot of the liver autoimmune diseases, we know what the targets are. We know the antibodies that are characterizing them. And one point I wanted to make is anybody who talks about anti-nuclear antibody as a single entity really will mislead you because anti-nuclear antibodies, particularly as defined by immunofluorescence, cover a whole multitude of antibodies. And some, for example, like the anti-SP100 or GP210 in PBC are specific for PBC. So when you talk about overlap, as others will do later on, sometimes it's not overlap. It's because people haven't differentiated the type of autoantibodies. We're moving increasingly from immunofluorescence to ELISA and other more specific methods. But just remember that the uh, 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 um, antinuclear antibodies in particular are not uh, a, a uniform group. They're multiple with different implications for disease etiology. The other point that I wanted to make is that in some cases we know there's a trigger. For autoimmune hepatitis, we know that some xenobiotics can do it. Statins, minocycline, nitrofurantoin, for example. Some viruses, some of the hepatitis viruses will trigger it. And we know, for example, with minocycline or other drug-induced causes, when you remove the drug, then the autoimmune hepatitis resolves without intervention. There was a debate about 10 years ago, I decided not to bring up the slides of this, showing that when hepatitis C was first hit, hit, hit interest, that there was a long debate as to whether hepatitis C could induce autoimmune hepatitis. Once the specific antibodies came and one could measure RNA accurately, it became very clear that hepatitis C was associated with autoantibodies, but there was no overaction with uh, autoimmune hepatitis. So there are defined triggers, and you'll know for PBC, a large number of drugs and uh, bacteria and viruses have been implicated, but none have been shown. There is, however, the overlap between the various uh, autoimmune diseases, PBC, sclerosing cholangitis, chronic hepatitis C, autoimmune cholangitis. They all overlap with autoimmune hepatitis. And one point I really want to drive home is that these are not specific diagnoses. They're syndromes, they're clusters, and they may well represent more than one etiology. And when one talks about autoimmune hepatitis, it's usually interface hepatitis on histology, maybe with raised transaminases. Overlaps and variants others will talk about. Now, the immunology of it has been pretty well discovered. And one of the nice things with immunology is everything goes either up or down. And the more inflammation, the more it goes up or down. And his immunologists have started to dissect what is going on, but essentially the key thing seems to be abnormal immune regulation and particularly the Tregs. Now, I don't want to discuss this too much today. I want to talk about one or two other aspects. Firstly, there's now increasing belief that there's a multiple hit hypothesis. There's causative antigens or agents and the omic profiles with genomics, metabolomics, proteomics, microbiomics, and so on, all these are combining to result in autoimmune liver disease. And I wanted to give you a very slight flavor of that. Now, as you can see, this is just one example of overlaps in of other autoimmune diseases in PBC. This is from one case. And as you can see, a number of organs are associated with it, but you can, it's not specific. There is an increased sibling risk, and this just shows the Lambda S score. 
as you can see, for primary bilious cirrhosis and PSC, showing that if you have one proband, then the sibling has a much higher risk of developing. Whether this means genetic and or environmental, of course, association does not mean causation. But genetics is increasingly have an impact in our understanding of liver disease. And Tom Carlson has produced this uh, a diary, if you will, going from 72 from the old MHC on, 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 in autoimmune hepatitis down to much more specific genetic abnormalities uh, in other diseases. When the autoimmune, uh, the, the HLA associations with autoimmunity were first described, it was in relatively small numbers of patients, 30 or 40, and people got very snooty about this, and uh, genome-wide associations of three or 4,000 patients uh, became fashionable, and a large number of papers, some of which are disappearing, um, came out. And these have shown, and this is one of the many PBC GWAS studies, showing that um, although the HLA is the most important, there are a number of other genetic associations, all of which are related to, uh, largely related to, to, to immune activity, uh, which are important. Now, whether they represent causation or progression, I think is still uncertain. And for those, as you can see, they're on different chromosomes and they have different functions. Similar things have been done with uh, PSC, and this again showing the importance in sclerosing cholangitis. And what's of interest is that PBC and the other autoimmune liver diseases share risk loci with other autoimmune diseases. And this is one quite elegant way of, of, of expressing it. And the point I wanted to make really is all the different diseases are on, around the edge and you can see where there's commonality genetic association. So if you have a genetic effect, what other effect? And the microbiome is becoming a topic of increasing interest that the contents of your bowel, the bacteria in your bowel, may affect not only uh, diabetes, obesity, and so on, but they may affect the propensity to autoimmune disease. And this, uh, just two brief examples, the one on your left uh, just shows um, there are different patterns in people with health and disease. And on the right, one of several elegant studies showing that the impact of in bacteria in the bowel will significantly affect, at least in animals, the appearance of biliary tract disease that m often mimics sclerosing cholangitis. The point I want to make, this is a very difficult area to dis uh, uh, investigate because the huge number of bacteria and identifying different populations but the microbiome certainly seems to affect the expression of some autoimmune diseases and you will no doubt be aware of the impact at least in animals of fecal transplants affecting the phenotype of obesity for example. Metabolomics, again, another study looking at the metabolites, whether in blood or urine, in people with health and disease, again, showing significant differences. But whether this is cause or effect, I think, needs further study. It is a complex area. I know that it's being done here by uh, Professor Chawler and colleagues. So it is another area where perhaps we can dissect why some people get autoimmune disease and others not. Very briefly about the treatment of autoimmune disease, it remains purely symptomatic. Autoimmune hepatitis is relatively clear. I don't need to discuss that. Steroids and azathioprine are the mainstay. In, certainly in the UK, budesonide is not used. Some can stop steroids. And as a rule of thumb, if you can stop all immunosuppression, then the diagnosis was probably not autoimmune hepatitis in the first place. The role of other agents, mycophenolate, calcineurins, rituximab, infliximab, they've all been used to various levels of effectiveness. As far as PBC is concerned, its name in the, the light of uh, cl clinical correctness has been changed to biliary cholangitis, a rather sort of uh, self-evident name because if it's biliary, it's cholangitis but it's not cirrhosis, and this was brought in really to highlight the fact that most patients with PBC don't have cholangitis. Urso has become the treatment of choice. There are a number of different classifications for the response, which you can see there, 
when you look at them, you see that the Paris criteria are probably the most discriminatory um, in those who respond and those who don't respond. And ERSO has become the treatment of choice. And those who do respond biochemically to ERSO do have a much better prognosis. However, about 20 to 30% of patients don't. And the new kid on the block at the moment that's just been licensed is a beta-colic acid, which is, which is another bile acid, a fastenoid X receptor, which does seem to have an impact. So an FXR is a nuclear receptor, which is in the liver and the bowel. It's a regulator of biliary homeostasis. And um, it does seem to prevent the accumulation of toxic bile acids. It probably has other effects, and John already this morning alluded to its potential benefits in the fatty liver. A double-blind trial showed that it does improve biochemistry, and when you stop the OCA, the chemistry reverts. The main drawback with OCA, I think, is going to be its risk of itching. It does, in a significant number of patients, result in increased itching. So ERSO is initial treatment, OCA in non-responders. I'm not going to talk about PSC because Varun is going to talk about that more. Autoimmune cholangitis, again, immunosedation. Now, I want to just really finally touch upon transplantation. I know that others will talk about recurrence, but I wanted to say firstly that we see in the UK and in the USA the indications for transplantation are changing, and certainly in the UK we're seeing a decline in PVC patients um, and an increase in PSC. In the US, they're seeing a relative decline in all three autoimmune diseases. But what I wanted to just raise with you, how can liver transplantation inform the understanding and maybe treatment of autoimmune liver disease? Firstly, if you're transplanted for autoimmune liver disease, you are at greater risk of getting but not only acute cellular rejection, but also a, vanishingly, uh, a vanishing complication of ductopenic rejection, but certainly autoimmune liver disease is associated with an increased risk of allograft rejection, both acute and chronic, as you see there. Now, a number of diseases can be trans uh, transmitted by stem cell transplants, and some of those are just listed there. So certainly, the gain, emphasizing that we can't ignore the lymphocytes as a contributory factor to the phenotype of autoimmune disease. Other conditions that certainly liver transplantation can transmit, um, ITP, again, we've seen one in the UK, one fatal case of donor-derived ITP, where the recipient developed no platelets and for various reasons died. Peanut allergy is another one which can persist for many months after transplant, again, transmitted by transplantation. Others are going to talk about recurrent disease, but the point I wanted to make for this talk is for autoimmunity, we see for recurrent PBC, these are Mayo Clinic data, that it occurs in almost all series the frequency, I think, depends in part on how much you look for it. But the two points I wanted to make from this slide, one is you see it at an increasing rate. It's not like hepatitis C where they all develop it straight away, but at least it's recognized up to 10 years. But just under half the patients get it only. So why don't all patients get recurrent PBC? Why do only some? And why do some take longer than others? And if you look for risk factors, well, the immunosuppression seems to play a role. Several studies have shown this, that it's more likely to occur and sooner on, on, on tacrolimus than cyclosporin. What's the implication of that? We don't know. Uh, it, it's one of the genotypes, as you can see that one there, which is an IL-2R one. Again, so genetic factors may play a role. Immunosuppression may play a role. For a current PSC, again, similar increase in the number of patients, but not all get it. And the major risk factor that we found, I know it's slightly controversial, but several others have confirmed it, is that the present or the absence of a bowel at the time or preceding liver transplantation is associated with a complete or very great reduction in the risk of recurrent PSC. 
You can discuss at length what the significance of that is, but it emphasizes the importance of the circulation of lymphocytes between the bowel and the liver. De novo autoimmune hepatitis, again, Anil's going to talk about. I think it'll be interesting to say, is this really de novo autoimmunity, or is this a form of allograph rejection? I know the answer. Whether he does, I don't know. We'll find out. Um, so the lessons from transplantation, excellent therapies, but despite that, auto we still transplant a significant number of patients for autoimmune liver disease. Why is it associated with both cellular and ductopenic rejection? I don't know. Probability of diagnosis of recurrent disease increases with time, but only in some patients. And why do you get recurrence, particularly of autoimmune hepatitis, which I haven't mentioned in detail, despite sufficient immunosuppression to prevent allograft rejection? And we know that donor and recipient factors affect the rate and presence of recurrence, but they differ between autoimmune diseases. So I've had a very rough or rapid and you may say incompetent run through, but I wanted to stress that autoimmune liver diseases are syndromes. They're not like hepatitis C or hepatitis B. They are defined on a cluster of clinical, biochemical, immunological, and histological features, none of which really is specific for each diagnosis. And I think as we start to unravel these, we will find that a lot of the gray areas will become clear. Expression of autoimmune liver disease, a combination of genetic and environmental factors. Treatment remains very empirical and we're good at controlling but not curing the disease. And the outcomes after liver transplantation, I think, provides clues as to the etiology, but I certainly don't seem to be able to put them together in any meaningful outcome or conclusion. So thanks for your attention.